Hello and welcome to the News Round, where we bring you all the latest from the aerospace world in our emerging markets of Africa, Arabia and South Asia. I'm Marcella Nethersole. And I'm Alan Teaford. We're going to look at the developing interest in passenger to freighter conversions with Israel in partnership with UAE and Ethiopia. Boeing is also investing to boost Ethiopia's ambitions to become the hub for Africa. Saudi Arabia is stepping up the campaign in London as it joins the big boys for defence. Etihad Engineering breaks new ground as it enters the aircraft interiors business. And we see how kids can use aviation crew training to learn survival skills. Join us after this short break for the news headlines. Welcome back. There was a major defence milestone for the Qataris Emir Air Force as it witnessed the rollout and the naming of the first advanced F-15 QA called the Abba Bill. Manufacturer Boeing described this variant of the F-15 as having made a transformational leap and claiming it has more speed, more range and more payload than any other fighter in the world. The first of these new F-15s will be ferried to Doha later this year following the completion of the pre-delivery pilot training. South Africa Airways is set to take to the skies again on September 23, 2021, with the airline announcing last week that the wait is finally over. It ended business rescue in December 2019, and flights have been grounded since September 2020. But from April 2020 21, the airline has been taking steps to fly again, including signing a deal with pilots and gaining approval for its air operator certificate. SAA will initially operate flights from Johannesburg to Cape Town, Accra, Kinshasa, Harare, Lusaka and Maputo. South Africa's low-cost carrier Comair has also resumed services after temporarily suspending services on July 5th in response to the implementation of an adjusted Level 4 lockdown. India's Directorate General of Civil Aviation last week approved the Boeing 737 MAX to fly in its airspace again, following safety modifications. The planes were grounded globally in March 2019 after two crashes within five months. Meanwhile, SpiceJet, the only Indian carrier with the MAX in India, has entered into a settlement with leasing company Avalon to pave the way for its MAX aircraft to return to services by the end of the month. Jet Aviation has gained approval in Geneva for Gulfstream aircraft registered in Turkey. With this new approval, the company's Geneva MRO facility is authorised to provide line and base maintenance to the G450 series, G550 series and G650 series aircraft that are registered in Turkey. The UAE has started issuing visas to Indian tourists after reopening its borders. Travellers will be required to present a valid negative COVID-19 test certificate issued within 48 hours from the time of collecting the sample and from an approved health service which uses the QR code system as well as rapid PCR test report conducted at the departure airport six hours prior to departure. It has, however, extended its ban on passengers entering from Nigeria. As the UAE continues to celebrate its milestone Golden Jubilee, Etihad Airways has launched the latest in a series of initiatives involving local Emiratis. And one 13-year-old has made an impression on the airline. Aisha al Obeid Lil, dubbed the youngest Emirati chef after being crowned Kidzania's Dubai 2018 mini chef, has been chosen by the airline to create a dessert to be served with Etihad's children's meals on its flight over the UAE's National Day weekend in December. And finally, a heartwarming story after seeing the tragic events unfolding in Afghanistan. It's a new beginning for an Afghan baby girl that was born on a Turkish Airlines evacuation flight bound for Birmingham in the UK on Saturday. Turkish Airlines said in a statement that 26-year-old Soman Nouri started having contractions during the flight from Dubai and gave birth to the little girl with assistance from the cabin crew while over Kuwaiti airspace at 33,000 feet. Thanks, Ella. Well, let's wish good luck to that family. Now, I want to take a look at the sudden spurt of interest in passenger to freight conversions. Freight numbers are looking good. Latest figures from IATA show global demand as measured by cargo ton kilometres and they've risen by 8.6% compared to the great figures of 2019 before the pandemic and are a firm indicator that cargo activities are sound. Well, they are if you've got enough aeroplanes. And Israel Aerospace Industries, IAEI, has developed a global reputation for converting retiring or surplus passenger aircraft into freighters. Demand is so great 
that partnership deals have been announced between IAI and Ethiopian Airlines and Etihad Engineering. In Africa, they signed an agreement with Ethiopian to establish a conversion site for Boeing 767-300 passenger aircraft. The new conversion centre will operate from Ethiopia's maintenance base in Addis Ababa and will be the largest and most advanced in Africa. As well as the actual conversions, the venture will also add cargo aircraft maintenance and overall staff training and guidance, as well as assistance in acquiring certification and licenses. Ethiopia's CEO, Tewaldi Gebrahim Mariam, said he would like to start the line with three Ethiopian Airlines-owned B767-300 aircraft, but will be targeting other operators of the type around the wider region. IAI then announced the deal with Etihad in the UAE, where they're going to develop a center for converting long-range Boeing 777-300 jets into freighters called the 777-ERSF. Tony Douglas, the group CEO at Etihad, said that the conversions were not only extremely attractive to customers, but they're also a technological breakthrough as they're greener, more profitable, and it's a highly innovative solution for airline customers. And that's a great example of how the Abraham Accord has opened the door for opportunities between Israel and the Gulf states. So it'd be great to see those 777 freighters rolling off the line. But credit too to Tewaldi and his team. As Ella reported in the news, South African Airways will be back in the air soon. But Ethiopian has not stopped throughout the pandemic and they're nicely positioned for the rise in passenger demand when Africa reopens. Indeed, it aims to become the hub for Africa and took it to another stage forward this week with the signing of a strategic MOU with Boeing to develop those ambitions. Of course, things had been a little frosty between the two parties following the tragedy of the MAX crash in 2019, but there's been a long history of cooperation over the past 70 years. So under a slogan of Ethiopia for Africa, the two sides are looking at industrial development, advanced aviation training, educational partnership, and a leadership development program while also growing a pipeline of aviation careers for young people in the region. Ella. Now, as more and more focus is put on passenger experience, it's no surprise that the world of aircraft interiors is becoming bigger business. We heard this week that Etihad Engineering, well known for its MRO capabilities, is to develop a cabin crew interiors manufacturing unit. To tell us about it, we are joined on the line by our MRO editor, Chuck Grieve. Hi Chuck, so why is Etihad making this unusual move? Ella, this is a very interesting development in additive manufacturing or AM. Etihad, as we know, was the first MRO um, in the Middle East to gain EASA approvals for design, production and certification of 3D printed cabin parts. And they've been working with one of the new joint venture partners for quite a while. So the R&D venture is with two companies called EOS, which makes 3D printers, and Baltic 3D, which provides industrial printing services. What they're trying to do is to, um, to test some new materials, uh, materials that typically are nylons or polymides. They're used for cabin structures, such as uh, overhead bins, um, the cabin dividers, galley and lavatory modules, some seat structures. They're going to be testing these um, uh, some sa samples of these materials for their for, for the flammabilities to make sure that they pass aerospace standards. The ultimate objective here is to accelerate the adoption of AM in aerospace. It's uh, you might call it the holy grail of internal of interior production, cabin production, because once you get AM going and um, on serial production, you can actually take advantage of the re reliable quality and the repeatability and the low cost of this fairly new technology. Um, Etihad is a, a, an obvious choice of partner for these other two companies um, because it's big on, on um, new technology and as I said it, it's already gained the approval, EOS approvals, to produce these structures. So is this something that are going to be using on their own fleets or is it going to be used for export as well? I think they'll be looking at a wider market Ella. The, um, the whole point of Etihad is it's a, it takes in their own airlines aircraft for, for MRO, but they also have a very, very strong third party uh, operation. Um, I expect they would be talking to their clients about the, the possibilities of gaining the benefits of AM manufacturing 
um, right now. They, they already have approvals from EASA to design, produce, and certify printed 3D printed carbon parts. Um, so I, I expect that they will be using this new involvement to extend that capability. I mean, everybody wants to go into serial additive manufacturing production. That whole digital manufacturing stuff is really changing business, isn't it, Chuck? Ella, there's another interesting development in the additive manufacturing world. We just heard that Boeing, along with EOS and three other companies, have successfully demonstrated that they can do distributed additive manufacturing. And this opens up a whole range of things. You could create a global supply chain where components are made where they're needed and don't have to be shipped in. It's a big move on the part of Boeing, certainly, to be able to have direct remote control of printers worldwide, that it does set up the possibility of worldwide digital manufacturing and serial production. Well, thanks, Chuck. Well, at the click of a button, you will be able to access a whole lot more about the global cabin interiors industry, as AIX Virtual, the online version of the annual aircraft interiors bonanza in Hamburg, will be underway from the 14th to the 16th of September. Well worth attending. And Alan, you're going to be another show this week, aren't you? Yes, Anna, indeed. Like many of those around the defence world, I'm going to be heading to London's Docklands to the Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Company's Excel Centre for DSEI, one of the largest defence shows in the world. Among others, heading from the Gulf to London, is Sean Ormrod, the CEO of Saudi Arabia's World Defence Show. He was on our Defence Monthly programme last week, and I asked him about what he was hoping to get from his attendance at the London event. There's still an awful lot of discussions to be had with uh, key players about positioning, uh, about proposition. Um, there's a lot to learn. Um, you know, a lot of my colleagues and a lot of big events are still going through all the protocols around COVID and how to get international visitors in, how to keep people safe. We learned a lot from IDEX earlier in the year, who did a fantastic job um, of that. A lot of those lessons have been learned for, for DSCI, and we're hoping to learn a lot from those too. Um, and, and overall, um, as I said, this is really the last opportunity to raise the profile and make people aware that there is a new event on the circuit um, and it's, uh, it's, it's next up. Um, and we're working flat out. We've just got six months and uh, one week to go now before, uh, before we open our doors with our new venue. Um, so we're very much looking forward to it. Well, in terms of targets, how are you proceeding at the moment? Are you getting pushback? Are you getting the big international defence contractors coming to you? I, I think it'd be fair to say, and I think that they're all there. Um, they're all more or less across the line. Um, we've got um, a, a, a number of deals that we need to complete, um, but I'm very certain that we are going to be in a sold out position um, and looking about how we squeeze people in. And I have to say, with a new event with six months to go, uh, that's a very comfortable position to be in. Uh, but it's also very challenging because it now means that uh, a lot of the, the, the smaller people in the supply chain who perhaps weren't quite so aware of, of the new event, or indeed maybe hadn't taken it quite so seriously when it was first launched back in uh, uh, July last year, are now starting to come up and say, me too, and we want to be involved. That was Sean Ormerod. The full interview about the World Defence Show and some other great defence stories from the uh, wider region can be seen in that Defence Monthly programme. Just look for the Times Aerospace channel on YouTube. And finally, when I was a child, we learnt about crossing the road safely and how to doggy paddle a width of a local swimming pool. But thanks to a new link between dynamic advanced training in the UAE and Dubai's Pirate Surf Rescue Team, which is a water sports program for children aged 8 to 18, youngsters in the Emirates are learning about survival. They were doing some wilderness first aid training, where they are put into escape room style scenarios, usually used in cabin crew training, and see how they react, as well as coping with the unexpected emergencies. And that's all we've got time for today. So. Do join us again in two weeks' time. And in the meantime, stay safe and get flying. Goodbye. Goodbye. How do we achieve ultimate defense interoperability? Inspired by Vision 2030, 
we are introducing the first of its kind, the World Defense Show. Integrating land, air, sea, satellite, and security.